This is a presentation on how to evaluate concrete arch dams. <clears throat> We're going to first run through the a quick outline here, discuss the objectives, some key concepts. We'll, I'll go through a, a case history and then there'll be a little bit of discussion on how to evaluate normal and flood loading, but the majority of the presentation will focus on evaluation of seismic loading as that's the, the bit likely biggest risk driver associated with arch dams. So the objective is to understand the mechanisms that affect arch dam failure, um, how to construct an event tree, and how to evaluate the nodal probabilities of that event tree related to failure of the concrete aspects of the arch dam in particular. So some key concepts for arch dams is that they are generally forgiving structures. If one area is overstressed, the load can be redistributed, redistributed and transferred by arch action to the abutments. They rely on load transfer to the abutments in order to remain stable. Sliding on weak foundation discontinuities has been the primary cause of historical arch dam failures, um, but that's going to be covered in other chapters within best practice. The focus of this presentation is failure of the concrete itself, um, not failure of the abutments or interaction with the, the dam and the abutments. There are no historical failures or really signs of distress associated with seismic failure modes, but those are typically going to be the biggest risk driver in terms of failing the concrete itself. Evaluating um, the potential for failure is going to be heavily re uh, rely on um, your understanding of concrete properties. Um, and then estimating the risk is, is difficult. Um, a lot of times you're going to need to develop a um, a full finite element model of the entire you know, dam in order to truly understand the response of the structure during an earthquake. And lastly, that just because you get cracking of the concrete, that does not equate to failure. You actually got to you know, develop you know, unmovable blocks that can then be pushed downstream, resulting in an uncontrolled, an uncontrolled release of the reservoir. So jumping into a case history, I'm going to talk about Pasamino Dam in California. It's a seven, it's a 370 foot high concrete arch dam that's a little over 10 feet thick at the crest and 99 feet thick at the base. It's been subjected to two earthquakes in its history, the 1971 San Fernando earthquake and the 1994 Northridge earthquake. The 71 San Fernando earthquake resulted in a PGA measured at the base of about 0.4 G. And at the time of the event, the pool was approximately 150 feet below the crest. Afterwards, it was noticed that there was a crack that developed um, within the contraction joint of the thrust block, and then there was extensive cracking in the gunite in the left abutment, so much so that approximately 72,000 square feet of, of material <clears throat> downstream in the left abutment moved about eight inches vertically and 10 inches horizontally. The 1990 for Northridge earthquake uh, resulted in a PGA of about 0.5 at the base. And at the, the time of the event, the pool was approximately 130 feet below the crest. After this event, permanent offsets were noted in the crest um, and the thrust block and underlying rock mass was noted to have moved away from the arch. Thankfully, after e neither of these earthquakes resulted in a catastrophic failure of the dam, but a lot of that is attributed to the fact that the pool was so low during the events, and if it was higher, it's very possible that this dam could have failed. So moving on into evaluating normal and flood loading. So if analysis or the historical performance of the dam under normal operations has not indicated any signs of distress, it's very unlikely that the risk associated with um, normal loading is going to be anything other than negligible. Um, however, if there is a well-defined crack pattern on the downstream face, it may you know, be prudent to develop uh, an event tree and you know, brainstorm some potential failure modes to determine whether or not that cracking could develop into uh, movable blocks that could result in um, an uncontrolled release of the project or the, the reservoir. So what are some uh, adverse cracks that you should be uh, keep in mind? And essentially here's two figures um, showing cracks that are parallel to the abutments. And the reason these are considered adverse 
is because um, they have the potential to link up with horizontal cracks either that are cracks themselves or um, lift joints. And if these connect up and crack all the way through, they can create movable blocks that then could get pushed downstream. Another example is here, um, again, adverse cracking is shown in yellow, and these particular cracks are due to ASR, um, but regardless of the cause of the cracks, it really you want to focus in on the orientation of the cracking to determine whether or not they're adverse. And with the yellow cracks, again, we have some parallel cracking um, that's, you know, diagonal cracking that's parallel to the abutment and some horizontal cracking that could link up and create movable blocks. The pink cracking at the bottom is actually a very common crack that you might find, but it's not really considered much of an issue because it's perpendicular to the abutment in order, and it's, it would be difficult in order for it to link up with other cracks to create movable blocks. So really you want to focus in on the diagonal cracks to the abutments and the horizontal cracks in the center of the dam That is in terms of what is an adverse cracking pattern. And getting into flood loading, so really the, the biggest issue with flood loading would, for an arch dam would be related to the potential for overtopping and causing erosion of the abutment and rock such that you could lose your arching action. But again, the focus of this presentation in this chapter is on failure of the, the concrete itself. And so that's not really going to be a focus here. And generally, if the, the dam has historically um, been able to resist the static loading under normal operations, um, it's highly unlikely that you're going to have much of an issue if you have just you know, small increases in your hydrostatic pressure in terms of the failing the concrete. But as with normal, the, the normal loading, you know, if you do already have an adverse cracking pattern on the downstream face, you will want to develop an inventory and actually evaluate the potential for failure of the, the concrete under flood loading. So now the focus of this presentation, um, for at least the rest of the way, will be um, how to evaluate seismic loading, because as noted earlier on, this will actually generally be the, the biggest risk drivers associated failing the concrete for an arch dam. Um, it should be noted that there are no historical arch dam failures related to seismic loading, but model studies by the Bureau of Reclamation have uh, indicated how this potential failure mode could actually progress. And essentially, you can, if you don't already have an adverse cracking problem, you can develop horizontal cracks in the center, diagonal cracks that are parallel to the abutment, and then these essentially link up and crack through the structure, creating a movable block. And then there's still sufficient energy within the event or the static load itself is capable of pushing that block downstream. And this is an example of entry, which essentially just runs through the same thing that I just discussed on the previous slide. You know, the first two nodes are related to your loading, but then you get into whether or not you can develop horizontal cracks, diagonal cracks, do they link up? Um, do you actually crack all the way through the, the concrete itself? And then is there enough energy either or load on the structure and then push that downstream to create an uncontrolled release? So when evaluating yeah, the failure related to seismic loading, um, some things to keep in mind. As I, I noted earlier in the key concepts, yeah, you're likely going to need to develop a full model 3D time history and finite element analysis that looks at the full response of the dam yeah, in order to truly understand how it's going to perform. You can look at the, the principal tensile stresses and um, compare that to the tensile strength to actually draw, see if you can figure out whether or not you have the potential to develop an adverse cracking um, situation. Um, and then the location and orientation of those cracks will be very important. Then if you can develop some adverse cracking patterns, you know, and there's potential for it to crack all the way through, the, you want to look into the probability of actually displacing that block. And, you know, you can either use the finite element analysis to determine how much displacement you might get, or you can go to some more simplified analysis, such as a Newmark analysis, um, if you don't have a, a nonlinear finite element analysis on which to, to base it on. The new mark analysis is likely going to be conservative because it's going to have to assume that the you've completely cracked through at the beginning of the time history 
which is uh, it's going to be very unlikely to be the case. And so whatever displacements it gives you, just note that those are likely going to be conservative. So when you're putting together a finite element analysis, these aren't for the faint of heart. Um, so it's best not to just jump into the most complicated model you, you can. You don't want to just jump into a nonlinear model. You, you generally want to start with something a little bit more simplified, a, a linear elastic massless foundation where you're using added mass to uh, represent the hydrodynamic load on the structure. And the reason for this is because nonlinear models can be very complicated to, do, to set up. And finite element analysis is only as beneficial as the inputs and the boundary conditions in which um, you consider in the model. And so the, the more complicated you go, the, the, the more likely you're going to develop errors. And so you want to start out with something a little bit more simplified. And then if that indicates that you might have an issue from a stability perspective, then you can kind of progressively work yourself into a more complicated type of analysis. So how do we take the information that comes out of a finite helmet analysis and turn it into a probability related to the nodes that I presented in the event tree earlier? And so <clears throat> here's a couple of examples of yeah, stress plots for a particular moment in time where you can compare the, the stress within the upstream and downstream face and compare that to the tensile capacity. And essentially, if you draw lines along yeah, through the stresses with, that exceed the tensile capacity, you can kind of get an idea where cracks might develop and you know get an idea, would these cracks actually be considered an adverse cracking pattern that could you know, result in movable blocks? And use this information to determine what's the likelihood of initiating cracks. And, you know, are they gonna be horizontal? And, and are there any diagonal cracking that could um, you know, initiate and, is there potential for these to link up creating movable blocks or is it just you know a bunch of cracks throughout the dam that it's not going to really link up to creating any movable blocks so other example outputs and so the bottom figure here just shows again a, a stress plot within the, focusing on the downstream dam and you can focus or you can see that the, there's a lot of uh, high you know, principal stresses in the center that are likely um, to initiate horizontal cracking. And <clears throat> then you can use time history um, stress plots to determine what's the likelihood that those cracks then propagate not only to create you know, an adverse cracking pattern, but also the potential for it to crack all the way through that to create a movable block. And you can use the time history plots to see uh, how how often is the capacity exceeded by what magnitude and what duration and use your engineering judgment based on that information as to what's the likelihood of you know initiating cracking and then getting these adverse conditions that could you know potentially get create a block that could be moved downstream and so if there the analysis does indicate that you can develop an adverse cracking pattern and you know there's still a couple things that you want to ask yourself as noted before just because you have cracking that does not equate to failure so the first question you want to ask is how likely is it that the cracking cracking pattern will be adverse enough to allow for block displacement again as noted if you just have a bunch of cracks that are just kind of random and they don't necessarily link up that you know, that's not going to necessarily equate to failure of the dam. you got to actually develop these blocks that can be pushed downstream. And if you do create that adverse cracking pattern, how likely is it that the correct cracked condition would manifest early enough in the earthquake such that there would be sufficient energy to displace it downstream? And, you know, if the, the movable block is created at the very end of the earthquake, then, you know, you're not necessarily going to get uh, an uncontrolled release. You may have a, you know, a very damaged, you know, concrete dam, but if you don't have the load to push it downstream, you don't have, you're not going to have that uncontrolled release and you're not necessarily going to develop any life loss consequences. <clears throat> so another potential failure mode that you should keep in mind is contact you know, failure or sliding at the base. Um, this is typically only a concern for non-radial abutments. That have the potential to open up in the downstream uh, direction 
Under strong shaking, the contact could be broken and the monoliths could slide at their base. Um, this is this could have been a potential failure mode related to Passamino Dam if the abutments opened up more than they actually did. You know, losing that arch action and there could have been the potential for um, not only failing in the concrete but you know sliding at the base as well. If the upper blocks move, your arch arch action can be lost, and if it is lost, you know this is likely going to be result in a failure, particularly for in, thin arch dams. Thick arch dams, they may be stable from a sliding perspective. A lot of times they are designed for the individual monoliths in order to be stable for sliding at the base. They still require the arching action in order for it, them to be stable, you know, from an overturning and not, you know, you know fail the, the internal stresses within the concrete. But, you know, they may, you know, individually, a lot of times they are designed, you know, to be stable from sliding at the base. And so this is generally more of an issue for thin arch dams than thick arch dams. And here's an example of entry. You know, <clears throat> your initial nodes are going to be related to the loading. And then, you know, the progression of this failure mode is going to be related to can you get separation at the contact? You know, or do you gonna, is there potential to lose arching action? If you do get separation, it, could that cause an increase in your um, driving forces, in particular your uplift pressures? And then what is your stability both during the event and after the, the earthquake event? You know, is there enough damage such that the structure would not be able to resist the static loading? As with, um, you know, the internal failure um, related to the cracking pattern and creating movable blocks failure mode. This failure mode is going to be, you're going to need a finite element analysis to truly get an appreciation of how the, the dam will respond and what's the potential for you actually getting a separation at the joints and losing your, your arching action. Without that information from a finite element analysis, um, you could try to use some engineering judgment based on the calculated stress levels and you know whether or not you think you might get enough displacement. You could try doing some new mark analysis to see if, how much displacement you might get and would that result in a loss of arching action, um, but really you're going to need a finite element analysis to inform you what's the likelihood of um, failing the structure via this failure, this failure mode. So the takeaway points are that the arch dams are generally forgiving structures as long as the abutments can carry the transfer load. If an arch dam is, has performed well, the chances of structural failure under normal conditions or even small increases in pools likely to be very small. Although no arch dams have known to fail during an earthquake, most risk driver potential failure modes are going to be related to seismic loading and shake table model studies have shown how this particular failure mode has, can progress. And lastly, really to understand how this failure mode, how the, the structure will respond to particularly seismic loading, you're going to need to a full and finite element analysis of the, the entire dam.